welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Remember, we're finalists in the podcast awards. You can help make us winners. Vote every day for the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at podcastawards.com. And I want to take a moment to wish everyone a happy Memorial Day as we honor those who uh, have passed on, particularly in defense of their country or law enforcement in the defense of their community. Well, now it's time for today's episode of The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. In our episode of The Adventures of Michael Shane with the case of the model murder. <laughs> Okay, Shane, get the picture. A guy in front of you with a thirty-eight, a guy in back with a rifle, and you with nothing. If wishing will make it so, you better start wishing to be somewhere else fast, because... This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back at his old haunts in New Orleans, in another transcribed episode. We call it The Case of the Model Murder. Wait of my compliments to the chef, this shrimp superb. Look, maybe I'm talking out of turn, Mr. Franklin. After all, you're hiring me, but 20 a day is mighty short wages for some of the things I get involved in. And I've learned that the phony cases usually have the biggest hospital bills. Phony, Mr. Shane? Yeah. I get a message that you want to see me urgently. Okay, I come dashing down here, expecting you to be tearing your hair or dying from a leaky artery. So what do I find? You find me in a seafood bar enjoying New Orleans' most succulent river shrimp. And sipping excellent dry Manhattan. That's right. Then you, you give me a story about a girl, Marianne Chevney. I have to find her and bring her to her home by Friday midnight or she loses eight million bucks. Is that too complicated? No, Mr. Franklin, it's too simple. Instead of giving me any details here, you go on chewing your shrimp. And sipping my Manhattan. <laughs> Waiter, one more of the same. Dry. Be sure you won't join me, Mr. Shevney. Look, look, this picture you gave me, is it the only one you have? The most recent, yes. It was taken a few weeks before Marianne ran away from home seven years ago. Oh. She never got along with her father. You know? What about this Friday business? Why Friday after seven years? Simply because Friday at midnight, Marianne will be 25. Uh-huh. So she's got to return home by then or she doesn't get her money? Mm, brilliant. Wait, another order of shrimp, please. You're sure giving me a lot of time. This is Thursday. I've got one whole day. Uh... Marianne's father was your partner, half-owner of Chevney Franklin Importers, huh? That's right. Yeah. Chevney died over three weeks ago. Why the sudden concern now? Oh, I haven't been idle. I've been running ads for the girl in the papers. Yeah, you've been a busy little bee, you have. Mr. Shane. All right, what happens to the eight million if Marion Chevney doesn't get home in time? It goes into the business. But you're the business now. That's right. Don't look so perplexed. It's quite simple, really. Yeah, something simple. You're hiring me to find her so that you can lose eight million dollars. Precisely, Mr. Shane. Wait up. Another dry Manhattan. We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the model murder. From the minute I walked into the seafood bar at the Carlton Manor Hotel and sat down opposite Franklin of Chevney Franklin Importers, I knew I was walking into something with more angles and a course in advanced geometry. My first impulse after hearing his story was to tell Mr. Franklin to go peddle his shrimp. Only I suddenly remembered that the only jingle I could raise in my pockets was the sound of my car keys rattling around. It seems his partner, Chevney, had died some three weeks before, and 
Eight million bucks he couldn't take with him was waiting for his errant daughter, Mary Ann, who'd run away from home seven years ago when she was 18. I was supposed to find the girl and bring her to her late father's house before Friday midnight, tomorrow night. Well, I took another look at the photo of the girl. The words Harrison Halstead Model Agency were stamped on the back. At least she'd worked there seven years ago. I decided to give it a whirl. The receptionist was a sugar blonde with a cooperative look in her eyes. Well, I sure would like to help you, Mr. Shane, but I really don't know any Miss Chevney. And you handle a lot of models here. Oh, that's right. This photograph help you any? Mm-hmm. Pretty. No, I'm afraid not. It's taken seven years ago. I'd just bet you'd go for something a little older. And you'd have a good bet. The boss around? Well, yes, Mr. Shane, but I don't know... Miss Winters, I want you... Oh, yes, sir? Mr. Shane's looking for a girl by the name of Shevney, Mr. Halston. Sorry, I can't help you. Now, this photograph... Hmm? No. What do you want with her? Well, she's got eight million dollars coming to her. Sorry, Mr. Shane. Well, that's okay. Miss Winters, get Miller on the phone, will you? Set will be ready at two this afternoon. Yes, sir. He recognized the photo. Did he, Mr. Shane? You're a real good kid. Company girl, loyal. <laughs> Thank you. Follow the rules. Uh-huh. Look, I'm just trying to help a penniless girl get eight million bucks. Well, take one of our cards, Mr. Shane. You just might want to come back. Thanks. Uh, I don't have eight million, but... You uh, don't need eight million. How much? Just enough for a rare steak and baked potato. It's a deal. <laughs> Miss Winters struck me as a girl with the wrong name. There was nothing chilly in her attitude. As for this Halstead character, he was one of those guys with a monogram complex. Everywhere you looked, you found H.H. staring you in the face. Harrison Halstead. On his tie, on the pocket of his shirt. Even the cigarette lighter on the reception desk had the same two H's sort of leaning against one another. And the agency card Miss Winters had given me, they were there too. As I waited for the elevator, I turned the card over. The handwriting was nice and firm. Mady Carter, 2614 Mount York Avenue, might be able to help you. I thought, Shane, how would you get along without that winning personality of yours? Mady Carter's place was a little bungalow in a court. There was a light on behind curtains. I rang the bell. Yes. Miss Carter? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you. What do you want? I'm looking for Marianne Chevney. I don't know anybody by that name. Miss Winters at the Halstead Agency. I can't, me... I can't. I don't know her. She isn't here. Shh. Easy. You better lower the volume. What'll the neighbors think? Come in. Thanks. Now, look, Miss Carter, I'm not trying to do anything but find Miss Chevney so I can give her $8 million. She doesn't want. Well. Now, you see, it doesn't pay to keep secrets. Where is she? I don't know. Well, how do you know she doesn't want the money? She told me. Oh, you spoke to her. No, no. Why don't you leave me alone? I don't know anything. Look, all I want... Uh, never mind, Miss Carter. Maybe I got a bum steer. Sorry I bothered you. I suppose I could have broken her down if I'd kept at it. But I suddenly found what I came for. There was an envelope face down on the desk. From where I was standing, I was able to read the return address on the flap. Big as life it was. The initials M.C., apartment 5, and the address 318 East 54th Street, New York City. M.C., Marion Chevney. As I drove back to town, I began to get a familiar feeling. Maybe I don't have eyes behind my head, but I do have a little spot between my shoulder blades. It's got a special talent. If somebody's following me, it begins to itch. It had bothered me a little right after I left the Halstead Agency, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And right now, it was giving me the squirms in high gear, and I decided to do something about it. I pulled off the main road onto a side street, but quick. I parked, doused the lights, and waited. Cars kept going by, and then I spotted a maroon job with one light dimmer than the other coming around the block for the second time. This time, it went about a hundred yards past me, and then it parked. I waited. Nobody got out of the car. The spot between my shoulders stopped itching. I knew I was on solid ground. I got out of the car and started up the street. I saw the guy behind the wheel of the maroon job looking straight ahead as if he had nothing better to do than just sit there. I 
Closed the door open and slid into the front seat. Huh? What's doing, champ? Nice tail job. No? Pro job. Well, you're not so bad yourself, spotting it. New Orleans does that for me. There's a field of the city. You must be from out of town. Yeah. Working? Yeah. Jonathan Franklin? Never heard of him. Franklin and Chevney importers. Bananas, I think. I hate bananas. <sighs> Who is it? You're doing all the talking, champ. This is a tough town for strangers. Not so tough. You're not so tough either. <laughs> right, nice tie you got. Slips up nice and easy. You can't talk, champ, but you can sure listen. Uh, it's a very pretty color you're turning. Now, let's see. Yeah, shoulder holster, 45 automatic. <laughs> okay, you're going to breathe now, but don't overdo it. And take a tip. I don't like being followed, and strangers in town ought to be courteous. You're a pretty tough boy, Shane. No, no, I'm the easygoingest guy in the world. I just don't like being tailed. Remember, mind your manners when you're in a strange city, champ. Franklin was in the dining room of the hotel, carving up some rare roast beef with Yorkshire pudding on the side. I dropped into a chair on the other side of his table and told him what I'd found out. As usual, he got real interested. New York, eh? Yeah? Would you join me, Mr. Shane? You're yeah. real worried about getting Marianne Chevney back here before tomorrow night, aren't you? Oh, you can't rush things, my boy. Ah, this case smells clear across the river. Don't you trust me, Mr. Franklin? Hey, one moment, Mr. Shane. Wait up. Yes, sir? Bring me a phone, please. Uh, you were saying... I said somebody's been telling me. I'd like to know why. You're implying, Mr. Shane, that because I don't trust you, I've hired someone to watch you? In a nutshell. Now, that is not true. But the fact that someone is following you is very disconcerting. Your telephone, Mr. Franklin? Uh, oh, thank you, waiter. You pardon me, Mr. Shane. Uh, travel desk, please. Hello? This is Jonathan Franklin speaking. Will you arrange for a charter plane with the New Orleans Charter Service, please? In the name of Michael Shane. Yeah. In about uh, an hour, it's now 8.30, the plane is to go to New York and leave here at 9.30. Thank you. Well, you're full of surprises, Mr. Franklin. And I've got another one for you. Yeah? If you succeed in bringing Marianne back here before midnight tomorrow, there's a thousand dollar bonus for you. Sometimes, Mr. Franklin, your conversation is positively brilliant. A chartered plane to New York and a thousand dollar jackpot at the end of the rainbow. I felt like a captain of industry as the plane got the right away from the airport tower and circled in for a landing. New York, great little city. It was four o'clock in the morning when the taxi pulled up in front of 518 East 54th Street. I told the cabbie to wait. What's money to me? Took the stairs of the brownstone two at a time. Apartment five was at the end of the hall on the first floor. I knocked. Nothing happened. I knocked again. Nobody could sleep like that. Then I tried the door. Locked. Apparently, Mary Ann was a dirty stay out late. Across the hall, the door to apartment number four said manager. I walked over and started knocking again. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm sorry to get you out of bed all the time, but I'd like you to open the door to apartment five. Are you crazy waking a body at four in the morning? Look, I'm a private detective. I'm looking for the girl who has that apartment. I want to get in, so I'll be there when she gets home. Private detective? <laughs> I'm sorry. If it was a police, it'd be... Does just... this give me the necessary rank? Five dollars. All right, make it ten. Well, <laughs> why don't you tell me it was a private detective in the first place? Come on. Hey, light switch in there. Yeah. yeah. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Here's your pound of flesh. Now, you won't tell her that I let you... Yeah. What's the matter with you? Hey, over there, on the floor in the hall. First, I saw a lot of blonde hair. And then I saw there was a girl attached to it. She probably would have been real pretty without that bullet hole in her forehead. <laughs> We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the model murder. A 
a glutton by the name of Jonathan Franklin had waved an ice-cold scent in front of my nose, but strangely enough, it still had a strong odor. My assignment was to find Mary Ann Shevney and get her back to her late dad's home so she could collect eight million bucks, according to the terms of her inheritance. Well, I picked up the trail at the Harrison Halstead Model Agency, where Miss Shevney had once worked. Mr. H.H. and his secretary, Miss Winters, acted like I was after Atomic Secrets. And as I left, Miss Winters shoved a card in my hand with the name and address of Mady Carter. Well, Miss Carter had the willies bad, but I picked up the information that the girl I was looking for was in New York. Franklin stopped eating roast beef long enough to charter a plane for me. And I arrived at the end of the trail just in time to find my quarry still warm, but with a bullet in her head. Oh, my... Police, we'll have to call the police. Yeah, but not before I make a phone call long distance. Well, you won't be long now, will you? Uh, Son, because they, they get real mad. If you don't tell Long them. distance, uh, I want you to get me Mr. Jonathan Franklin at the yeah. Carlton Manor in New Orleans. Oh, you, Collect. Oh, Michael call. Shane at this end. Hey. That's right. Uh, this is uh, Circle 65970. Yeah, my reputation. You know this will be in the papers, don't you? Be police all over the place and reporters. Yeah, yeah, and her blood stains a nice carpet, yeah, too. I feel real for sorry that. for you. Hello? Well, don't be uh, hello, Mr. Franklin. Yes. Yes, what is it, please? Well, no, take no, your earmuffs no, off. No, you no, might no, like no, to no, hear no, this. No, oh, what is it, Shane? No, Just a second, Mr. Franklin. No, look, look, old timer. Don't phone. you have a telephone in your own apartment? Yes. Well, I never thought of that. Well, think of it. Well, Shane? The gal is dead. Really? Now, yeah, what do you want me to do? Come on home. You've done a good job. You're not sorry? No. Should I be? Well... What about the one grand bonus? I guess that's cold turkey, huh? We'll talk about it when you get back. Yeah, yeah. Cold turkey, did you say? Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it. That's an excellent thought. With a glass of cold milk, of course. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. I had a little time before the cops had come, so I started moseying around the apartment. First thing that caught my eye was a cigarette lighter on an end table. It looked familiar. Very familiar. All of a sudden, I knew why. There was a monogram on it. Yeah, two H's sort of leaning against each other. I got the long-distance operator again and put in a call to Mr. Halstead. Also collect. There is no answer. Are you sure you got the right guy? Harrison Halstead's residence in New Orleans, Orange, 2435. Okay, thanks, operator. Shall I try later? No, thanks. I didn't know how, but it was pretty obvious that Halstead was in this thing up to his ears. I kept on wandering around the living room, and then I found it. There was a letter on the table in a girl's handwriting. The date was just two days ago, and the letter started with the words, Dear Matey. I didn't have to read the signature to know it was Mary Ann. I took a good look at the girl on the floor. Her hair was blonde, only there was about a sixteenth of an inch of dark brunette showing at the hairline. I got real smart then. I finally figured it out. This girl was Matey Carter. And the frightened girl back in New Orleans was really Mary Ann Chevney. Only somebody else had apparently made the same mistake, and it was my guess he was hightailing it back to New Orleans to correct his error. I made a quick call to Homicide to pay my respects and then headed for the airport. Luckily, the plane was ready to go when I got there. Oh, Shane, you had the girl in your hands, and then you waltzed off with a dream. One thing was clear. Mary Ann Chevney had plenty to worry about. It took me just ten minutes from the time I landed back in New Orleans to get to her place. The door to Marianne's bungalow was locked, and there was no answer to my banging. I started around the house trying to get a look-see inside. Nothing. Nobody home. When I got around to the rear and peeked in the bedroom, I saw why. The place was empty. Either she decided to run, or else she'd been taken on a trip without a return ticket. I scrambled over to Carlton Manor, and guess what? Yeah, Jonathan Franklin was eating. It seems you made a mistake, Mr. Shane. How do you know? The papers. Wasn't Mary Ann who was killed in New York. It was a girl by the name of Carter, Madeline Carter. You still want me to find Mary Ann? Oh, of course. Let's see. It's three now. You only have nine hours left. Oh, uh, would you have some lunch? Bouillabaisse. Huh? No, thanks. Don't you ever find time to eat? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm peculiar. I only eat three meals a day. <laughs> Marianne Shevney's life was in danger, and I wanted to get to her while she was still hale and hearty. I drove over to Halstead's agency. Miss Winters still had that cooperative look. Well, hi there. 
Hi, where's your boss? Out. Been in today? Well, I know. As a matter of fact, he hadn't. Did you try to reach him at home? Yes, I did. He wasn't there, huh? Oh, is something wrong? Something's very wrong, sweetheart. Look, that note you slipped me last night. <laughs> Not the kind I usually write. Mady Carter. You knew I was looking for Marianne Chevney. Well, I said Mady Carter might be a help. She's a friend of Miss Chevney's. You didn't know there was a switch? Switch? Mady Carter was in New York. She was killed last night. Killed? Halstead could have taken a plane up there last night, couldn't he? Well, I, I don't know. As far as you know, he could have, couldn't he? Well, yes. I haven't spoken to him since last night. Tell me, is he a bachelor? Yeah. Lives alone? Uh-huh. In town or in the country? Both. Oh, he has a country place. Where? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. You want me to look it up? You bet I do, sweetheart. If I'm not too late, it might make the difference between a long and wealthy life or a 45 slug to Marianne Chevney. It took me almost an hour to drive out to where Halstead had his beach home. The place had a real subtropical flavor, bordering on the gulf and surrounded by a mass of lush undergrowth and stubby cypress trees. I didn't bother to announce myself. I just barged in. She'd been here all right. There was a woman's jacket over a chair in the big paneled living room, and her purse half open on the floor. I went to the back door and opened it and looked out. <laughs> Bounced off a stone, and I caught a glint of the bullet as it wind off on its ricochet. It had come from the left. I ducked back into the house. <laughs> he had shells to burn, whoever he was. It was no sense my perching like a sitting duck, so I started toward the front. The living room had been empty a moment before, but now there was a man in it, a man with a gun. Halstead. Stop where you are, Mr. Shane, and raise your hands. Where's Marianne? It's none of your business. I said raise your hands. Now look, Halstead, don't be coy about this thing. There's a guy out there with a gun, a big gun, and he's got big ideas. So have I. Move back. Against the wall. Look, who's working for who around here? You've been sticking your nose in where it doesn't belong, Shane. Told you yesterday that there was anything about Marianne Chevney you ought to concern yourself with. What did you do with her? Let's just say she's in protective custody. Yours? As I said, that's none of your business. But... Hello, champ. What's uh, doing? Still telling me, huh? Yeah. And this time, no necktie. Very bad taste. Huh? Drop that rifle. I don't think so. You ought to practice more, you mess. Oh, this is real cute. Champ was in the kitchen with a rifle, and you're in here with a pistol, Halstead. You both have a grudge against me, only you can't stop worrying about each other. Shane, who is that man in the kitchen? I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet, but I think he's after Marianne, too. Aren't you, Champ? Could be, but right now I get more places. <laughs> Missed again! Just stick your head in that doorway once more. Now, Mr. Shane, I'll give you just three seconds to tell me what you want. I told you! I want the truth, now! What difference does it make what I want with the girl if you're already... All right, Shane, I want you! We'll be back in just a moment with Mike Shane and the thrilling climax to our story. It was a second or two before I realized Halstead had fired at the laddie with the rifle, not me. But I wasn't inclined to administer first aid to Champ lying in the kitchen doorway because from the look on Halstead's face, he was getting ready for a repeat performance. And then I got a shock. Like when the shower suddenly turns from hot to cold. Mary Ann, the real Mary Ann, stepped into the room and went over to Halstead. I figured it was time to call a halt and settle who was who. Hello, Mary Ann. You... You killed Mady. No, the champ in the kitchen. That was his work. Why don't you leave me alone, all of you? All I've been trying to do is bring you back to your father's home by midnight tonight so you can inherit the eight million he left you. Marianne and I were married last night, Shane. What? So now the matter of her inheritance is my business. So why don't you leave us alone? I will if Marianne or Mrs. Halstead will go back to her father's house. But why, Mr. Shane? Why should I go back there? Well, if the eight million doesn't mean anything to you, the thousand I stand to collect means plenty to me. I knew it was the right time, six o'clock, when I walked into the dining room of the Carlton Manor. Jonathan Franklin was having breast of guinea hen under glass and a white wine. Well, won't you sit down? I'll have the way to get you. No, no, thanks. Yeah, you look calm and relaxed, Mr. Shane. Success? Yes. Splendid. And Mary Ann? I found her. And her husband. Her husband? That's right. Oh, your boy is down at headquarters, Mr. Franklin. Headquarters? My boy? Yes, the champ. He talked when he came to. He got a little overeager after he trailed me to Halstead's beach house, and Halstead winged him. Oh. The way I figured, it 
wasn't a question of Marianne getting back to her father's home before her 25th birthday. No. Uh, This wine is delicious. 1929 Sauternes. No, it was a question of whether or not she'd reach her 25th birthday. And that's why you had me searching for her, to find her so you could have her killed before she did. Now, you're not going to spoil my dinner. You know, there's an old saying, Mr. Franklin, the foolish person eats himself into the grave. You you say he talked? Yes. He told us why he'd been following me. So that if I found Marianne, he could kill her. He told us how he was sent to New York before I left. I should have guessed that, Mr. Franklin. It only takes ten minutes to get to the airport from here. Why make the charter for an hour later? You you have a point, And there was only one person besides myself and Marianne who knew the address of Mady Carter in New York. Yeah. I should have thought of that, I suppose. You uh, finished with your dinner, Mr. Franklin? Yeah. Because if you are, there are some men waiting for you in the lobby. Homicide detail. You're spoiling my digestion, Mr. Shane. Doesn't matter, Mr. Franklin. From now on, you'll be eating crow. Hearty appetite. <laughs> Mike, what I can't understand is why Mr. Franklin was so eager to get his partner's money. He must have made the same amount himself. After all, eight million dollars. That's enough bait for anybody, sweetheart. With his appetite, maybe he needs 16 million to keep in groceries. Especially with prices the way they are today. <laughs> oh, Mike. Sugar, you're cute. Now, I eat your steak. And will you have a red wine served with it? Waiter, a sparkling burgundy. Domestic. Year of 1948. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from the mysterious and colorful New Orleans. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, uh, in this one, we get to hear Jack Webb in a role other than LaSalle. And I think this is the one I heard him in this uh, non LaSalle role. Some programs are more about the journey than the destination, and this episode definitely feels like this, as the solution was kind of obvious from the start. We get to the end, and it's like, what's that, you say? The person who stood to inherit $8 million if she uh, died was behind the whole thing? You don't say. But there were aspects of this that were surprising at times. Though, to be fair, I don't think it taking an hour for the plane to be uh, chartered was actually much of a clue, because even if the airport is close, it often does take time to uh, line up a pilot and uh, get all the clearance required. Though I suppose it could have been a clue with some investigation. All right, well, uh, I do want to let you know that uh, we do actually have a special Memorial Day podcast. A new episode of The War has been added uh, for the first time in uh, more than a year and a half. And uh, this one I'm pretty much sure will be the last episode. You can check it out at thewar.greatdetectives.net. Um, but that will do it for today. Uh, we will be back. Uh, tomorrow with uh, The Avenger with a very a special uh, dedication in that program. And then 
Coming a week from Wednesday will be Richard Diamond. And next Monday, another episode of The New Adventures of Michael Shane. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook 